has five minutes to do a little introduction. Um, I'm going to cut them off firmly so we everybody has equal time, and then we'll go from there. Good. So I'm going to start. Uh, so obviously, inequality has become, I'd say, over the last four or five years, a huge issue in in the United States. Uh, interestingly, I, I don't think it's been much of an issue before that, but it suddenly became this primary issue. It, it, it got to a point where uh, you couldn't open up a New York Times uh, or a Washington Post uh, paper on any given day and not find several articles blaming almost every problem in the world, including terrorism in the Middle East, on the issue of inequality, on the issue of the gap. Remember, inequality is the gap between rich people and poor people, rich in the middle class, middle class and poor, but something about the gap in income or wealth, depending on who you speak to. Some people refer to income, some people refer to wealth. But it's, you get the general idea. It's the material difference between us. Um, uh, obviously, President Obama said this is the problem of our time. The Pope said this is the biggest uh, economic issue uh, of our time. And many people attribute the election of Donald Trump last week to people's angst about the issue of inequality. So I'm going to argue today that inequality is irrelevant. It's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, it's a who cares. That there are real problems in the American economy, in American society. The problems are poverty, the problems are people being poor and not having the tools, not having the environment in which they can rise up easily into the middle class and above. There's a problem of no economic growth. The economy is not really growing or growing too slowly so that the middle class feels constrained because there's so little economic growth, so they don't feel like they're really, their standard of living is rising. And there's a problem at the top, a real problem at the top, and that is the problem of cronyism. There's much too much government in bed with business uh, determining winners and losers, and as a consequence, some people gaining money, not because of their skill in the marketplace, or because of values they produce, but because they're in bed with the right politicians. All those problems are real. They're happening, and they need to be dealt with. None of those problems are caused by inequality. Not a single one of them. Inequality might be a consequence of some of them. But it's not the consequence that is the problem. It's the underlying phenomenon. The phenomenon of lack of mobility, the phenomenon of cronyism, the phenomenon of no economic growth. Those are what we should be focused on and trying to find solutions for. Indeed, I'd argue, the most of the proposals to deal with inequality will make the problem of poverty worse, the problem of cronyism worse, and the problem of no economic growth worse. So the proposals being provided, much larger redistribution of wealth, more regulations, more controls, raising the minimum wage, will all make these problems much, much worse. In a free market, which I believe is the solution to all three problems, in a free market, People make money by creating values. They make money by selling us services or products that we value. You become very, very, very rich in a free market by improving the lives of lots and lots and lots of people. Great. I love billionaires if they made their money honestly and in the marketplace because I know that every billionaire out there that did that has made my life or somebody's life that I know better off, whether it's a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs or Sam Walton. They created wealth by making my life better. It's indeed the only way you can create wealth in a free market. I buy an iPhone for 300 bucks. How much is the iPhone worth to me? Well, more than 300 bucks, otherwise I wouldn't have bothered. My life is better off for that. Apple made a profit. Cool. They made a profit off of making my life better. That's wonderful. Or take, what have I got? 45 seconds? Okay, so I leave my J.K. Rollins example. Right, I'll end with this. Right, J.K. Rollins became a billionaire. She used to be a welfare mom. Income inequality exploded because of that. And yet it's wonderful. I got poorer because of J.K. Rollins. I'm really depressed, right? I don't know about you guys, I read all the books. My two sons read all the books. I went to all the movies. I spent over a thousand bucks on J.K. Rowling's stuff. I got poor by a thousand dollars. She became a billionaire. There's income inequality for it. But you know what? I am much, much better off 
for having read Harry Potter and for my kids having read Harry Potter. Who cares that she became a billionaire? I actually think it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Thank you. Uh, I should start saying I'm against equality, in particular regarding time. Uh, I want to have more time. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, uh, I, I'm, I should say I'm, I'm here mostly to, to react to, to, to uh, Yaron's uh, views. Uh, and uh, I want not to distort your views uh, in trying to react to your views. And uh, your argument is, I think, a variation of an argument that has been fairly typical in this discussion. Uh, which is essentially the issues are, you know, I'm going to simplify it and then you said a few other things, but you know, the issue is not inequality, the issue is poverty at, at the bottom. You said cronyism at the top and you said also growth. Uh, this is sort of the three sort of issues. But you know, in the debates of inequality, I'm not a, I do inequality to the, to the extent that inequality is relevant for Latin American economies. Uh, it's, it's a fairly common argument. You know, you shouldn't care about poverty, you should care about inequality. So there is no no relevance to the issue of inequality, what you call the gap. So the difference between the wealth, however you measure that, the wealthy and the relatively poor. However, your own argument of how we solve all of these three problems, which is the free market solves all the problems, is that you, uh, you said, I love billionaires. Uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Sam Walton, and J.K. Rowling. I hate her. I hate those films and that. <laughs> films were okay, that's, good. That's another story. But, uh, <laughs> I like George Lucas, yeah, and <laughs> more the well, that's an, another story. So, uh, the story has implicitly an idea that inequality matters, and so, so, so that inequality, you actually like inequality, that's what you're saying. You, you think inequality is good because inequality is functional to solve the problem. You're saying, again, part of what is the conventional story in economics, uh, we still teach it, I'm sorry to say, uh, to all students in a sense, the idea that uh, it provides the incentives. So the, the person that is poor, by the fact that they are lagging behind, they have to work harder and sort of improve. And, and I have problems with all of these arguments. Uh, so, so I have problems with the notion that uh, only poverty matters. I have problems with the idea that, uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, incentives are what matter to create wealth. Um, and so I suppose we're going to go back and forth and we'll have more time to, you know, uh, go into several of these. Let me just give the, the first sort of uh, shots at, at these ideas. Uh, first of all, uh, I think at the core of this is a question of causality. So you also said, and again, quote, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, that you think that some of these three problems uh, um, are cause, you know, uh, cause inequality. So, so uh, you said inequality is the result of, for example, the lack of growth. That's what you would sort of suggest. And, and that's fair enough. I think that there is a two-way road sort of in, in, in that respect. But the problem is that inequality is instrumental in generating some of these three problems. So inequality causes some of them. Uh, so there is an issue of causality here, at, at, I think, at the heart of the, of the differences in view. So I think that uh, there is significant evidence that suggests that uh, more equalitarian, I mean, it's debatable, it's not you know, valid in all circumstances in all times, but there is a substantive uh, you know, amount of evidence that suggests that equalitarian societies tend to uh, grow faster, they have better social outcomes, including those associated to poverty, so more unequal societies will end up having not just higher levels of poverty, but you know, uh, worse health outcomes, uh, lower life expectancy. So the US, for example, even though it's a very wealthy country, has worse health uh, results, life expectancy, than almost all their peers in Europe, Western Europe, that are more equalitarian, even though we spend even more on health than they do. And, and there are several issues associated to, to, to inequality to explain that. I see that I have one minute. Uh, I also have uh, an issue with uh, the notion that, yeah, I mean, Bill Gates, where do I start? You know, he, he, he bought for peanuts uh, an operational system that he, you know, basically what he did, are, you know, his life better is by signing a contract with IBM, and, and that's the extent of his genius, and he got a monopoly. So you dislike monopolies, good lord, I don't know if that, the, the, if you look at how the internet and all of those things happen, you know, uh, I'm there and say the, the opposite word, it's not the free market. And I, I don't like facilist solutions, that it's all the free market solves everything. I also don't think the state solves everything. So I'm going to give you a fuzzy sort of rage story. But, you know, it was DARPANET. You can sort of check your emails there because the military were, you know, funded by the state 
and produced all of that technology. And you had, I have 12 seconds, and you know, and a lot of that was done by cooperation. So cooperation is as important as egoism and you know, and the incentives of trying to better yourself. So cooperation matters too. All right, a lot to talk about. So we won't have any problem bouncing each other off of each other. Uh, let me be clear, just to clarify my view. Uh, I don't believe inequality is good because it's functional or because it provides incentives. I believe inequality is good because it is just. Because inequality <coughs> is what happens when you leave people free. If you look around the room, we're all different. We all have different skills. We all have different talents. We all have different incentives, different motivations. Um, some of us work really, really hard and we get really great grades. Some of us cruise a little bit in college. Um, would you want to give the people who cruise a little bit in college the same grades as those who work really hard and get straight A's? Do you want to give everybody A's even when some people are smart and some people are not so smart? The reality is we're not all equally smart. So inequality is a reflection of our metaphysical nature. It's a reflection of who we are and what we are. It's a reflection of our morality. The fact is, we're unequal. Now, some of us even make choices not to be rich, like anybody who's chosen to be a university professor, right? <laughs> university <laughs> professors. <laughs> are yeah, I was already rich. I don't know that. <laughs> some, some might be rich. Some of us are not. We're not rich when we started. Um, university professors don't make a lot of money, but they're really smart. They have high IQs. They could have probably gone. We could have probably gone to Wall Street or somewhere else and made quite a bit of money. Economics, finance, we know math, we can do this stuff, right? But we chose to be teachers because we love, hopefully, <laughs> I hope this is true of most professors, we love teaching or we love research. We love the intellectual engagement and we're willing, Summers, man. We're willing to give up, yeah, we're willing to give up some money in order to do the fun stuff that we love. Life is not about money, but life is about inequality. Everywhere you look, there's inequality. It's who and what we are as, as a species. We're different. And if you leave us free, if you leave us free, then we're going to have different outcomes. So to me, inequality is a feature of freedom. That's why I love it. It's not a bug, to use tech terms, right? It's not a bug of freedom. It's a feature of freedom. Because I love freedom, and that's my key, I love freedom. I don't want people taking my stuff away from me in the name of some morality that they decide is good for me. I want to be free, and when you leave people free in any society, uh, what you get is inequality. Now let me just address, uh, so that's my moral point. My moral point is because I, I love individual freedom, because I believe individual freedom is the moral, is the moral base, that's why I like, I like inequality, because it's the obvious, necessary outcome of leaving people free. Okay, let's get a little bit to economics. What about these correlations? Well, look at the studies. Yes, Zimbabwe has very high inequality and has horrible health outcomes. By the way, how you measure health outcomes is very distortive, and well, we're not going to do a debate, hopefully, on healthcare, although we could. Um, the United States might have lower life expectancy for a variety of reasons, but if you have cancer or if you have heart disease, there is no better place in the world because survivability rates for cancer and heart disease in the United States far higher than anywhere else in the world. Far higher, not even close. So there are reasons why life expectancy is not, we don't match other countries in life expectancy. Um, but these correlation studies, and it is, it's correlation is not causality, but more than that, it's if you look at the studies and look how they group countries that are unequal and countries that are equal and what they're actually grouping around, they're very dubious. Um, we can talk a lot about monopolies. I would love to stand here and, and defend Bill Gates. Uh, I have no problem, by the way, uh, in a free market of somebody having a very large percentage of the market. I don't think that's an economic problem. I don't think in history we've seen economic problems in a relative free market come out of so-called monopolies. Uh, corporation, let, I'll end with this. Yes, I love corporations. Capitalism is the system of corporation. It's not the system of competition. The essential characteristic of capitalism is cooperation. You cooperate cooperation across within a company, but think about, you know who makes some of the stuff in this? This is an Apple, by the way. You know who makes some of the stuff in this? Samsung. So oh, they compete? It's going to explode. 
<laughs> That's, Apple has protected us from the explosive parts of the Samsung. Um, companies cooperate much more than they actually compete. The essence and, and the cooperation goes across with customers, suppliers, everywhere. The essential characteristic of capitalism is voluntary, win-win cooperation. I'm out of time. Perfect. <laughs> you did uh, a good job. So, uh, let's go back. So, I, I you know, I'm ten, I have a tendency to think of these things in, in more uh, quantitative, functionalist even, sort of uh, ways of looking at it. Uh, uh, you know, Yaron comes from a libertarian sort of philosophy, and I suppose uh, he tends to think in terms of uh, issues of um, ethics. So that's what you're uh, referring to, and fairness and freedom. Uh, so I'll engage a little bit on that, but that's certainly not uh, what I think is the most relevant issue in the discussion of. Uh, but you know, it's fair enough. It's in the question there. It's inequality fair. I, you know, that's a complex question. So uh, a few years back, there was a study of capuchin monkeys. And they had to exchange a rock for a cucumber or a grape. And these are monkeys, not even apes. And the one monkey that kept giving the trainer a rock and got a cucumber after twice of this happening, he gets pissed off and throws the cucumber. He wants to, you know, great. He's not stupid. There is an intrinsically unfair uh, exchange that the monkeys, you know, the monkeys capable of understanding. So, I think you said that inequality is a feature of the species. So I'm no, a free market. Free market. No, you, you said inequality. No, we're, yeah, uh, we're different. Okay. Okay. Sorry. But not fair enough. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> and it's an intrinsic question of our morality. I think you said. So that would make us less than the capuchin monkeys. From what I understand, we evolved to have a sense of fairness. And you know, there, I think when they teach political economy in this uh, university, they teach about uh, an experiment, which I forget the name. It's, the, um, uh, it's an experiment in which basically they give you $100 for one person that has to give the $100, and you know, they make a, uh, it's a little game, and they make a decision of how much money they give you back. And, and the notion is that they're not close to 50%, and there's extensive studies of the this. The ultimatum game? The ultimatum game. So somebody was paying attention in that class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so good for you. Uh, so the ultimatum game suggests that we're hardwired to think in terms of fairness. Um, and, and that fairness is, it's not the fairness you suggest. The fairness of inequality is good, it's the fairness of some degree of equality is a good thing, uh, and which again goes to the notion that because we lived, you know, in hunter-gatherer societies for, for uh, you know, millennia before we, we came down, yeah, you know, right after we came down from the trees, and, and so that means that we are probably hardwired to think in terms of, of fairness and that kind of inequality. So when I think of fairness and freedom, freedom is another word that you used, and uh, I have some time. So, uh, and that comes very often in, in terms of the discussions, for example, of free trade, which I think it's a terrible misnomer. Uh, people that think about free trade, and I don't know your positions, maybe you're very radical in terms of this, but people that are in favor of free trade, they don't necessarily, they're not often against, uh, you know, saying, look, we, we are going to decide that uh, you cannot sell us poison. So there is a minimum of regulation that says, you know, uh, the things that are going to be sold in the market have to be, have some minimum standards. And that's already managed trade. So we're deciding that for phytosanitary rules, we're managing trade, uh, which seems to be a reasonable thing to do. So, uh, so the question we're discussing really is where do you draw the line, you see? So obviously there is an issue of uh, how much equality you want and how much inequality you, you want, and which seems more reasonable debate from my point of view, and how much uh, inequality is fair and how much it can hurt. And again, it goes to the issue of causality and if we go back to those uh, those issues that, you know, you sort of wave and dismiss the data, said, you know, all the data, you know, it's correlation, not causality, forget all of those studies. And there is a lot of problems with, uh, you know, uh, with studies that that's, uh, you know, uh, it's obviously true. Uh, but the correlations that, that I'm suggesting are, are fairly strong. And, you know, and again, and indicate, uh, for example, think of this. Let's forget Zimbabwe, which is probably, you know, an outlier anyways, and the U.S. is an outlier. But let's think globally. 
uh, what's the period, you guys know what's the period in, in the whole history of humanity that we grew faster? It's a period called the golden age of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So it's a period from the mid 40s to the early 70s. That's the, also the period in which the welfare state bloomed. So we had more government spending, significant redistribution policies in terms of health, social security, and so on and so forth. And yet, we didn't have a problem in terms of growth. And I'm precise at five minutes. <laughs> okay, well, there's a, are we still going? Yes. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot there. Uh, I don't believe fairness is hard way. I believe people's attitude towards fairness change all the time. And indeed, attitudes towards fairness in Europe are very different than attitudes towards fairness in the United States, are very different than attitudes towards fairness, I suspect. I don't know this in Latin America, but certainly in Europe, about, about, what? about fairness. Attitudes in Europe and the United States, the attitudes towards fairness are very different. And attitudes towards fairness in the United States have changed over time. When surveys were done 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 100 years ago, uh, asking questions about what other people made, people tended to have the attitude, I don't care, or good for them to being rich. We have become systematically over time more envious society. I believe that has to do with the rise of a certain philosophical attitude in this country that's more collectivistic, more egalitarian in terms of outcome. And again, we've seen this in this last election where both candidates, I believe, are both egalitarian and collectivistic, very collectivistic, both of them. So that we stop caring about the individualists. We're not any more individualists, which I think is the core individualist, not in the sense of being on a desert island, but in the sense of primarily caring about your own well-being. We've stopped being a society of individualists, which was the way this country was founded, and have become a society much more like Europe, which is collectivistic group think. I care about my position within the group rather about my position vis-a-vis -vis relative to my talents, my abilities. I would like to see us returning to becoming individualists instead of being servants of some collective, which psychologically, I think, distorts our perception of fairness. Um, I am for absolute free trade. Um, it, fraud is wrong. The only role of government, in my view, is to protect us from fraudsters and crooks and criminals and terrorists, and, but to protect us, to physically protect us. Uh, yes, if you're selling poison and pretending it's food, then you should be banned, but that's not managed trade. That's just basic function of the courts and, and government. Um, 40s and 70s growth, first empirically, uh, economic growth was much faster from the Civil War till 1914, till the break of World War I and the 40s and 70s. Average growth then was higher. But 40s and 70s did not see a massive uh, role of government in spite of the rhetoric. 40s, there was a massive role of government because of the war. So a lot of money was put. But standard of living in the United States, GDP went up during the 40s, which is bizarre. It tells you to suspect GDP numbers, but it went up dramatically during the war. Standard of living collapsed. Uh, there was no welfare state in the 40s and 50s. Remember, the welfare state is the creation of the late 1960s. It's a creation of the Johnson administration, 65 to 68. So you had Social Security, but no Medicare, no Medicaid, no welfare state, no massive redistribution title under welfare state. That's all uh, Johnson's Great Society, 68. And guess what happens right after that? Right after that, you get the 1970s, a period of stagflation, massive inflation, horrible economic growth. I, 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 I always am bewildered by people who look back at the 70s and say, oh, what, what a wonderful period of time for America. It was one of the most horrible periods in, Amer in entire American history. It was a dark, violent, horrible era in America. This is why they were willing to elect somebody who was as radical at the time as, as Ronald Reagan was. Uh, it was a depressing period. I, I lived in the, in the US for a little while in the mid 70s. Wouldn't want to go back then uh, in any respect. The New York was a dump. Nobody went out at night because it was dangerous. Uh, the economy was, was in a tank. American corporations were losing business in mass in those days to the Japanese. Of course, we demonized the Japanese in those days, right? We wouldn't let them buy assets in the United States. They were the bad guys. Trade barriers, Ronald Reagan passed a number of trade barriers against the Japanese to protect our industries. Now we're doing the same thing to the Chinese. Um, they are overpaying for our real estate just like the Japanese overpaid for the, our real estate uh, back then. Uh, there's nothing about the 1970s to glorify, R really nothing, um, except the music. The music was the best. <laughs> Popular music was very good in the 70s. Um, so morally, hopefully not disco. No, no, not disco. No, but, <laughs> just sometimes. But Friday, yet, man. yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I correct myself. <laughs> no, 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 not disco. Not disco. Not disco. <laughs> but hey, we had Pink Floyd. 
Yeah, yeah no, it was good. It was, it was, it was, it was good. My son said punk. Punk was awful. Um, <laughs> off topic. All right. Um, so, if you if you really want economic growth, the formula is simple. It's cut government, reduce government spending, reduce government regulation, reduce taxation, particularly taxation that is attempting to manipulate, that it is attempting to give favors to some at the expense of others, uh, which is what Reagan did, tried to do in his Tax Simplification Act. But, you know, it wasn't that simple, but uh, he tried to do that. All right, so uh, if, if you want real economic growth, every country that's deregulated cut taxes has done very, very well. Okay, so we'll have, uh, I think uh, on that last note, I think I understand why the Oxford uh, Dictionary gave, you know, the post-truth, uh, you know, the word of the, well, the year. I really, the countries that cut taxes and deregulated did well, uh, we can talk about that. Certainly, you know, Latin America, it's an experiment of, you know, terrible consequences of exactly those policies. But uh, let's, uh, let's go back to some of the stuff you said at the beginning. Um, you suggested uh, issues about fairness, so we're back to the issue of fairness in general, and I want to say something about that. You, you again brought something that it's often uh, bring, yeah, you know, it's brought in these discussions of uh, inequality. The idea that envy, the people that want more equality are envious, which is a funny thing. You, you, you suggest that equality, yeah, you, know, you say basically equality is good. It provides incentives. You say that's not the main reason, but you know, I know you said that it's not the main reason. But you use the argument. You know, you, you get things from people that have incentive. As I said, it's because it's fair, um, and 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 you have here an argument of envy. Envy exactly. You know, uh, it's the the story of what's behind uh, the the good side. You know, of inequality. Because uh, if you're envious, that means that you know, you would have the incentive to to better yourself. Uh, I, you know, I, you know, on this issue of, of fairness, I think that again, as I said, I, I don't think uh, I'm concerned with your sort of uh, fundamentalist view. Let's call it that. A view that uh, that uh, inequality uh, is always good, and that individualism is always good. When the evidence is, I mean, by far. The evidence is that we are sort of a mixed uh, sort of uh, bunch. We, we work better when we have uh, some individualistic sort of concerns, but also some sort of cooperation. And, and that's that sort of mix uh, that, uh, that it's visible in those things that I said before. So the, the, the game, it shows that you know, we are hardwired to you know, be cooperative. And I'll give you an example, an example in which cooperation is central, the state is central, markets are central. So, uh, and about growth, so we have always. So I'm going to choose to talk about this. So think of the world that it's you know that we have. This phones, the internet, and all of this. How is it possible? So we gave a monopoly to AT&T to have long-distance uh, telecommunications with one thing in exchange. That's what the government of the United States asks AT&T to do. All of the research and development you do, we give back. You give back free to all the companies around. And they used at that time at the beginning to do you know, telecommunications from California to New York. Uh, big tubes, you know, it was uh, those things that used to have on TVs, the vacuum tubes. And this company, because they have a monopoly, they have tons of money, they have a mandate to do research and development, and they have to keep growing because of all of this stuff. They go and put all of these scientists to research on ways of doing this better, and they start to think of electronics. So Shockley is the guy that, but other two guys also got it independently within Bell Labs. So Bell Labs has a monopoly, which is a sort of a subsidy given by the state. So the state is providing them the resources by providing a monopoly for them to do this. And then this is given away. So you think of Texas Instruments, you think of for almost anything. So Silicon Valley, which is central to understand, and I think would agree to understand development, and you cited Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, happens because this man had studied, Shockley had studied in, in Stanford. And he goes back to Stanford and opens his own firm. Uh, he apparently was an, can I say this, an asshole? People hated him, and so he, uh, they left. After Trump was elected, you could say anything. Yeah, apparently you were right. <laughs> uh, so, so they leave, and they, and they create their own company. You know, it's an iteration of companies, but one of those is Intel. So, so that's how that happened. So it's not the idea of the genius. What's behind your notion of it's the individual as a hero. It's the Superman that comes with one sort of big idea and solves all the problems. Whereas I tell my students when we talk about technology class, technology is more like the IKEA chair. 
So you build one. The first like, chair is wobbly. Why? Because you've never done that before. The second one is sort of decent. The third one is perfect, and you know, I'm sorry to say you cannot make a career out of that. But most of the technological development is associated to small incremental increase in knowledge, which is a cooperative game. It cannot be done by the individual. The first steam engine is from ancient times. It took us 2,000 years to make it useful. So it takes cooperation. So the idea of the you know, hyper-individualistic you know, society, it's simply not in the facts. So how many more of these are we doing? Just I'm curious. Uh, well, we're getting, we, can, we can move we can, in the can, Q&A no. whenever you want. OK, let me, let, me, let me address the question of individualism, because I think it's an important one. And then we can, we can sure. at some point, we can open up for the audience. Um, yeah, I mean, you can easily make a caricature of individualism. Uh, the guy living on a desert island all by himself, build, making everything, building everything, inventing everything. Because guy, God forbid, he doesn't read Newton, he doesn't read anything because he has to invent everything from scratch. But that's a caricature. That's not what individualism means. Individualism means that the individual <laughs> is the moral agent. The individual it, it, it is, it, the purpose of government is to protect that individual's life, and the individual's Purpose in life is to make his life the best that it can be. Now, what would you rather be as an individualist, right? You're 100% dedicated to your own life. That's all you care about. Would you rather live in a civilized society and cooperate with people to make things so that you, and trade with them, win-win relationships with lots of people to grow and to become better and better and to, and to recognize the fact that you're standing on the, on the shoulders of giants who came before you? Or live on a desert island all by yourself in the middle of the woods in, in Pennsylvania. Well, it's obvious. Society exists because it's good for us. Because as individuals, we thrive in society. It's much better to have lots of people to trade with. Division of labor, you know, if you go back to Adam Smith, than to live in a society where you have to produce everything, as we did indeed, going back a long, to, a, a long enough uh, into the past, the uh, human past. We were pretty poor back then. So... Cooperation is a feature, again, of freedom. It's a feature of individualism. But what would you rather work in a team of individualists, which means people thinking for themselves, people motivated to do the best job that they can because they want to be good at it, and who are communicating with one another because they want to achieve the greatest results, or a group where the group is the point, the group is the standard. And they're always looking for a leader, which always happens in a group where the group is the purpose, to tell them what to do, which is what collectivists always do. I would rather have a group of individualists any day, and I think most technology companies in Silicon Valley have that. Now, this issue about the internet being created by the government and so on, yeah, the military did a lot of research, universities did a lot of research. Let, let me just say that even in a free market that I believe in, there would still be a military and they would be doing research. Um, even in a free market, as I believe in, there would be universities. I hate to say it because this will create some controversy, but they would all be private, but there would still be universities, and they would be doing research. So research would still be happening even in a free market. Um, yes, the basics of the internet were created in the university setting and in DARPA, which is a, which is a defensive body. But none of that affected any of our lives until it became a commercial venture until entrepreneurs figured out how to use it in order to make money. In, and they cooperated doing that. So Fairchild Semiconductors, which is, which is the, 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 the company that was created, then was the two spin-offs, one was Intel, the other spin-off was Venture Capital. Venture Capital was invented from the people who came out and they funded pretty much everything. Yeah, they worked together, they cooperated, Intel had to cooperate with Microsoft and with IBM, Apple had to cooperate with whoever they did, again, how many different companies make stuff that goes into this iPad? Hundreds, maybe, you know, who knows, maybe even thousands, I don't know. But lots, they all get paid. The beauty of the market system, the beauty of capitalism, is that everybody who adds value gets paid based on the value that they add. And if you add a lot of value, you get paid more. And if you add less value, or the value, less value that lots of other people can provide, you get paid less. That's the way the system works, and in that sense, it's a virtuous system. The more you add, the more you get. The less you add, the less you get. So it's a, so it's 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 a free system in which people choose who to you know what to produce, 
who to work for, how much to charge for their labor or for their stuff. Uh, and in my view, and, and again, you know, we can discuss the empirical evidence, um, the more the government gets involved, the less innovation, productivity, and economic growth you will get. I fly airplanes a lot, a lot. Basically, the airplanes I fly in today are the same airplanes we've had for 50 years. The 787, the greatest, best Boeing air jet, is the same as the 707. It's actually slower. I've seen a graph where every 10 years, the airplanes get slower. The one innovation in aircraft, carry, aircraft, which was the Concorde, was killed. The automobile, the internal combustion, basically the same car we, we have today. Almost no innovation in industries where you have heavy, heavy regulations. Huge innovation. After AT&T is broken up, because you allow for a free market. That's when the innovation happens. The innovation happens when government steps back. When government steps back from Silicon Valley, boom, it exploded. If government starts regulating Silicon Valley, which it's starting to do, you will get constrained. Taxis have not innovated until Uber showed up. And now that Uber is going to get regulated, that innovation is going to be crushed as well. So I'm do, out of time. Let's do one more five minutes, and then we'll move into closing statements, and then we'll move into Q&A. Third week, okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, society exists. Do you like Maggie, Maggie Thatcher? Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she, she would wear my face. that society didn't exist? No, she never said that. I thought she did. I mean, there's a sense in which she, society doesn't. I thought she did. But maybe I'm wrong. Okay, fair enough. At any rate, uh, I'm glad you think society exists. That's a step forward. Yeah. So we're, I, I we're, moving, we're moving along. <laughs> I'm, I'm making you move. So, um, so uh, you know, talk about caricatures. Uh, you know, the group is the purpose. Uh, and only govern. What I suggested is that you know technological change depends on cooperation. Depends on cooperation of government, markets. She said there's no such thing as society. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So you and admitted in the, that there is such thing as society. And in the context, so, in, the context she, in the context she said it, I agree with her. <laughs> so we'll get to that context. Fair enough. Uh, so uh, but the point is that uh, the point is that you know. So what I suggested is that there is a significant uh, amount of cooperation in order to get. Uh, and again, I'm afraid of you know this this uh, this sort of absolutes. You know, it's uh, free, and the only way you get stuff is uh, when it's you know it's the free market. Yeah. You know. So let me go back to something you said. Say you said regulation of phytosanitary rules. It's not uh, it's not regulation. That's the free market, and that's just the government. Well, it's like the point. It's the government saying, you know, here's a regulation. Here's, you know, in any trade agreement, there is a regulation that says you cannot, you know, sell these sort of things because you're going to be responsible in a court of law, and that's written in law. So that's a regulation. So this is a question of, you know, it's not whether you're half pregnant or not. You already admitted. So this is a debate between Keynes and Hayek. Hayek says, yes, I admit this, that, and the other. So fair enough. So now the discussion is where do you want to put the line? By the way, you're already pregnant, man. You know, you admitted that you want some sort of regulation. How much you want, fair enough, you want less, I want more, but you admitted you want some. So it's not no regulation. So the absolute already vanished. I also don't want, you know, if you're gonna be caricatures, I don't want to be North Korea. Who wants to be North Korea? So if that's the, the notion, you know, we want to be on the other extreme and we want nothing but, you know, a government that controls everything and whatnot, and we put a picture of, you know, President, you know, Chairman, Chairman Don, uh, they're on top, and we'll all be happy. So certainly that's a terrible idea. The point is that it's somewhere in the middle. I, for example, would certainly agree that uh, protection of certain quality of certain jobs, which you certainly disagree, is a good reason to have uh, you know, uh, regulations on trade. Uh, or certain types of compensation for people that lose in the process of you know, an integrating society. Because again, we're part and we're in the same boat, and it's not true the incentives, which whether you like it or not, you end up coming back when, when you say that taxes and regulation are a problem for growth, what's basically suggesting that taxes and regulation distort markets and hence don't get prices right, and hence we don't get. The problem with that, I mean, I, we will have to stop this, I'll have to give you a lecture in economics. There's no proof in economics that that actually works that way, okay? That markets, if left to their own devices, there's no mathematical proof of that. Uh, when they get the proof, you know, the arrow of the blue is of a system that has no correlation in anything that you, know, you have in the real world. It's with all you know, markets, you know, uh, futures, and, and, and so on and so forth. 
They cannot prove stability of that thing. So it's a mythical idea. So that's the risk of basing um, practical sort of ideas on the basis of fundamentalist ideology. I, I, I find, uh, I find the, the free market ideology, which is intrinsical to neoclassical economics and to some version of, I suppose, uh, what's in the back of your head. I cannot sort of, I, I suppose, be an Randian that it's some version of something that is akin to Austrian theory. Um, so it's some version of that, of a general equilibrium in the sense, yeah, with complexity and this, that, and the other, but the market somehow sort of get, uh, there is no evidence, uh, there is no, no theoretical proof that that actually works. So, so let alone a, a discussion of, uh, of uh, how it works in practice. Um, the other thing that concerns me, so, so now that we're throwing stuff, of, I, I think the 70s were a terrible decade. I, I had to leave my country in the 70s. There, there was a military coup uh, you know, uh, in Argentina. Uh, I ended up growing up in Brazil. Uh, similar situation, for example, in Chile, and I don't have much time. But uh, the thing that concerns me is that sometimes, and I'm not suggesting this about you by, by all means, but you know, it's that some people that took this sort of idea of uh, individual freedom being essential, uh, like Friedrich Hayek, uh, he went down to Chile and there's pictures of him visiting Pinochet and whatnot, and him saying that, uh, you know, essentially that uh, economic freedom was more important than uh, you know, political freedom, and that economic freedom is the way to get to uh, political freedom. And I, I find, again, it's the, uh, and I'll, I'll finish here, I find the fundamentalist notion, the notion that, you know, uh, that it's only the absolutes that things work that lead to this, so both on the right and on the left, that lead to this sort of uh, massive violations of the stuff you say you trust and treasure, that it's uh, in individual rights. So let's wrap it up with some closing statements. Closing statements. Okay. Some questions. Yeah, let me let me just follow. follow. And, and by the way, I, I'm not accused. I, so yeah, I, I'll I, clarify I, Pinochet. No, so we no, no, so no, no, no. I'm, I'm just suggesting. Not. I'm just suggesting that it has led yeah. under certain circumstances to that kind of position. So. I don't believe you can force people to be free, and I don't think you can kill people in the name of trying to get other people to be free, like Pinochet did. So I'm, I'm very much opposed to Pinochet, even though the economic policies he put in place, to a large extent by accident, uh, not because he believed in them, but because he just happened to put in the right people, actually led to Chile going from the poorest country in Latin America to being the wealthiest on a per capita basis in Latin America. But that does not justify anything else that he did. Um, look, I'm a fundamentalist. I believe in fundamental truths. I believe in the sanctity of the individual. I believe this country was founded on the principle of sanctity of the individual. Unfortunately, the founders were not very consistent about that because they had slavery. But that is the idea that is, is crucial and that makes this country exceptional, and I do believe in American exceptionalism in that sense. Uh, I believe in individual freedom and individual liberty. Um, and that what the role of government is, should be limited to the protection of individual rights. So every law that comes before government sh or Congress or, or should be evaluated not based on its utilitarian uh, benefits or costs, not based in on which pressure groups want what, which is how it's based today in my view, but based on does this law protect individual rights or doesn't it? And individual rights are, very, are something very clear. They are the freedom to act, to gain the values necessary for your own life. It's freedom of action. That's what individual rights protect. Your ability to do what you believe is necessary for your life. As long as you don't violate other people's rights, and the only way to violate other people's rights is by physical force or fraud. That's the only way to violate other people's rights. So the only job of government is to protect us from physical force or fraud. All other economic or social regulations should be gone. And that, that's true of the bedroom as much as it's true of the of trade, of the boardroom. Right? Government has no business in our lives. It has no business using its coercive power to shape and determine your, our behavior. If I want to buy something from somebody who happened to be in China, it's none of the government's business. It's none of your business. And indeed, trade, for example, doesn't happen between countries. The United States doesn't trade with China. I trade with some Chinese guy. A Walmart trades on my behalf with some Chinese company. It's none of anybody's business what happens in that transaction any more than it's in California's business whether I trade with somebody in Arkansas or in Pennsylvania uh, here. The government 
has no wall unless what I'm doing is causing, is, is defrauding you or using force on you in some regard or poisoning you in some regard. That is violating your rights, limiting your ability to act in a physical way. So the fundamental here is not, so there's this distinction between law and regulation, but I don't want to get into that. The key is, is it protecting individual rights or isn't it protecting individual rights? So morally, government has no business in trade. Government has no business in the internet or in automobile regulations or any of these, or any business. The government has no business in business. Now, I would, I would, love, to, I would love to be able to rewrite the American Constitution. Um, and have a separation, just like we have a separation of church and state, which I think should be taken a lot more seriously than most people do. A real separation of church and state. I would like to see a separation of economics from state. I don't believe the state has a role in economics. I don't believe it should try to establish economic behavior. I don't think it should start, try to protect certain workers and not protect other workers, or bail out certain firms and not bail out other firms, or determine how much money we should have in the economy or not. I think the government should be neutral when it comes to economic policy. There should be a treasury secretary in that sense. The markets, we should let markets work unregulated, uncontrolled, un, uh, uh, you know, un, without the imposition of coercion. Government as, as um, what's his name, Washington, what's it? as President Washington said, and I think in his second inaugural address, government is a gun. The essential characteristic of government is force. That's the difference between government and any other human institution. Guns don't belong in schools. Guns don't belong in boardrooms. Guns don't belong in bedrooms. Guns don't belong in our lives other than to defend ourselves. That's the role of government. Self-defense. That's it. Uh, I have to say something about society, because uh, I think Barbara Thatcher was actually quoting Iron Man, in a sense. Uh, and what she said is, in, in reality, there's no such thing as society. In reality, there are only individuals. But individuals come together, and they form groups. Groups, in that sense, exist, but they can't be the primary. The primary is the individual. Groups are there, when, when they should be voluntary, groups are there in order to, because we voluntarily choose to associate with other people in cooperative ventures in order to enhance our own lives. Uh, okay, so let me uh, say a couple of things. Uh, and, and one is, you know, going back to something like you said in the previous iteration, but you repeated here sure. again, and I, I forgot to say something because I you know, wanted to respond to something else. But uh, you gave the example of, you know, the island versus, you know, going to cities and cooperate, and which, uh, and, you know, which that's something reasonable, that people have to cooperate, which, thanks God, so we sort of agreed on, on, on that. But, you know, you see, now you're bringing something to the table, so they're forced to compromise. But they cannot, as you admitted then, hope that technological innovation is not the idea of the genius, the Superman. It's done in cooperation. So you need to get ideas of other people, you need the ideas of people that came before the Newton, the guys, you know, sure. so, so you admit that. So it's not individual, it's a group cooperative effort. The question of whether, you know, who are you putting, I mean, who is against individual rights? So nobody's suggesting that you, know, you eliminate individual rights by accepting that you have to cooperate. What you're accepting is that once you enter a group, if you enter a group, you accepted the rules of that group. And that's one of the things that, you know, there are several reasons. I assume you will accept the notions of, say, uh, you know, public goods. So there are certain things, or maybe not. So, so that's the traditional sort of story of why we accept, and there is a debate of what goods are public goods. So, you know, public lighting, whether it's a public defense, is it, you know, or not. Uh, it's traditionally defense is the one seen as health, which many people uh, that are libertarian think it's not. I tend to think it's a public good. And by the way, the government does provide it better. So if you, if you look at the cost of Medicare, they have been growing much less than, say, the costs of uh, private insurance. So uh, so that's one of the things that, you know, uh, would, you know, but it might not, that's a different question of whether it's a public good or not. So. Uh, I have a question for you at the end, but you know, so, so the other important thing that I want to address is the question of uh, government has no economic role, no business in business, if I quote you right. Mm -hmm. So let markets work. And that presupposes an interesting thing. I'm always puzzled by this one, teaching economics, that there is this notion that markets, you know, they arise magically out of thin air. 
that all of a sudden, boop, market. I don't know what happened, you know. And we already have a market. But when you look at the story of markets, for example, mar financial markets in the Western world, you know. Financial markets in the Western world occur because you have all of these groups that get together in the you know, little city states in Italy, you know. You know, they're merchants basically that control the you know the local uh, government, and they decide to together pool resources in order to go and do this venture, and they borrow money essentially from themselves, and they create a public debt, and it's the public debt that generates you know uh, the a secure asset because those public debts were normally uh, backed by taxes, so they agreed on something cooperatively. We're a poor city, you know, Genoa. You know, my family comes from Genoa, long distant, lost in the past. And you know, it's, a, it's a little town in between the mountains and the sea. There's nothing else to do. So they, they throw themselves in this venture together because it's the way of surviving together. Not because they gave up their individual rights, uh, but because that venture that they get together, you know, they're accepting not just the public debt, but we're going to tax each other. And the taxes are going to pay for that debt. It's the security of that debt, that the debt is guaranteed by taxes of a common people that agree on the form of government that, by the way, not only gives us democracy eventually, way further down the line, but give them a financial market because now you know what happens, you can trade those bonds in secondary markets and all of a sudden you have what? Financial markets development. So it's the, the financial market is a complicated outcome of the relationships of the state, the people, uh, of society, uh, of cooperation, and they arise. If you look at the, you know, there's a famous book that if you haven't read, you should read. It's a book that uh, everybody in college should read. It's called The Great uh, uh, Transformation by Polanyi. And he tells you how in the 19th century, the three essential markets of capitalism, those that we learn in the textbooks, you know, the labor market, it's created. The financial market, it's created. And, and the land market, it's created. And regulations are essential to creating markets. When you think of the medical story of how they created Wall Street, it's a bunch of guys after the, 90, the 1790s sort of crisis that say, these are the rules. If you want to participate in the market, you have to pay a fee. So there are rules. And those rules you know, are a form of self-government. Sometimes self-government is essentially self-government. But sometimes it's, you know, what's supposed in a democracy is, is self-government is us. So the idea that government is something alien to us, alien to markets, something to be feared, although these days it is to be feared. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a, I think, a dangerous idea. The government is ourselves, you know, and, and you know, I think actually, it, you know, the current election reflects something on ourselves. Probably we are a little bit misogynistic, xenophobic, racist as a society, and we should shape up. So. I wanted to ask you something. Oh, yes. Uh, did you say that you think you're against all regulation regarding uh, automobiles? So, like DUI, those things, all. Oh, so, all things are gone? Well, DUI is not a regulation on the automobile industry, but I, yes, I say uh, a DUI is a, your risk to other people. You're violating other people's rights by, by drinking, so, driving your But yes, uh, seatbelt laws, definitely. You're uh, against. I'm against. Uh, fuel economy laws. Um, uh, weight, car weight, car distribution. All, I mean, there's so many regulations that go into automobiles, I'd be against all of those. And I actually would argue that all of those laws make automobiles, make automobiles less safe. Fair enough, but you know, the other thing connected to that, so, so I mean, you said that we have the same cars as before and we have no, so the, the Google challenge actually led to driverless cars and, and we're having electric cars. By the way, the electric car was with us in the 90s. Because of regulation, because of uh, regulations, it's, it's, it's with us today because the government's subsidizing it, and, yeah. and that's why I resent Tesla and I resent Elon Musk. I, I consider him, you know, this is a monstrosity. So, so rich people are buying Teslas. I see them all over the place. I'm subsidizing it, me, right? Because it's coming out. You, you're subsidizing it less because you live in Pennsylvania. But the state of California gives Tesla hundreds of millions of dollars at my expense. That's that's mind-boggling to me. If you want to build an electric car? Do it, but, but do it on your own time. So let's say that you know, we have a public, I, mean, I think it's a public good, maybe you don't think it's a public good, the environment. Yeah. So we're yeah. going to run into trouble. Yes. Uh, apparently. <laughs> or not, or you know, depending on who you ask. But you know, most people think we are. Yeah. And we are. Uh, that's another question. Uh, do, you, do you think, for example, regulation that, uh, so you're certainly against the Paris, Paris Agreement or any, well, you know, not for the, yes. I, I'm not asking for, Paris Agreement is a bad sort of, you're against any kind of regulation regarding the environment. So, because, you know, one may be against well, the Paris Well, it depends what you mean by environment. 
It's a, it's a slip, it's a tricky topic, right? Because environment covers a lot of no, things. No, but the tricky topic. So, 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 so if you want to talk about global warming, then it's a say no, global no, no, warming. No, 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 no. But let me ask the question right then. So, yeah. so my question goes back to the question of absolutism. So you have, you know, this sort of notion: the solution is, you know, to one extreme. You know, we do nothing. Which yeah. I, I don't think we're doing anything. So, so we're my doing point is, <laughs> uh, we, we. So the point is, you, you think that. Uh, there should be no kind of regulation, so in terms to prevent, uh, so it's it's zero approach. You you do nothing about you know regulation of say uh, what we put you know factories can put whatever they want no, up there. No, so, so again, this is this because is the point of poison. Made something. No, no, but this is the point of poison. Yeah, but then but, it's a regulation. No, it's not a regulation. So if pregnant. if you can prove that what I'm spewing out of my factory is hurting you physically. Then I'm then I'm hurting you, and there's there's a long precedent to civil law, at well before the, the you needed a, a regulatory agency to monitor this, uh, to, to address that. You can't drop your bar, your garbage in my backyard. We know that we've known that for a thousand years, right? So you're for a mandate on on buying health insurance because you know people are hurting us. No, no. I'm not getting. We're paying more. We're getting paid in hurt. Why? Know? Because because we man, no going. because we changed the law in 1986 actually under Ronald Reagan that said that everybody has to be treated in the emergency room. Everybody. So yes, yeah, so if somebody doesn't buy health insurance and is in a spot and then walks wait, in wait, and, wait, he's got, and he's got a cold. Shouldn't be treated in an emergency room? No, I don't. I don't think there should be a legal mandate. I think the hospital, I mean in the past, if you were in a life, if you were, if, if you were in a life threatening position, they treated you because that's what doctors do. They treat you, right? But if you came into the emergency room with the snivels, with a cold, they told you to go home. They weren't gonna treat you for free, but today, we have mandated that they treat everybody who walks into the emergency room for free. So yes, why buy health insurance? You guys don't need to. Just go to the emergency room and they'll treat you whatever you have. Now certainly if you're dying, doctors will treat you. And then they'll try to bill you and try to get money from you. And people were not dying in the streets in 1985 before, before this bill passed. It's complete nonsense. So yes, we have so, and you mentioned Medicaid, right? The reason Medicaid is cost are cheaper is because they buy in mass and they squeeze doctors. So doctors now, in order to make back the money that Medicare squeezed out of them, raise their fees so the insurance company has to pass it on to you. So us buying private insurance are subsidizing Medicare. So of course Medicare is cheaper. By the way, that's why healthcare in other countries is cheaper. Because Americans are subsidizing all the research. 75% uh, of R&D comes from the United States. All drugs. Uh, uh, we, we have market prices here, they can sell them below market in other countries and the, and the pharmaceutical companies. So we're subsidizing all the R&D in pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, sure. There you go. For the whole world. Yeah. And that's why they have good health care because we're paying well, a lot of money. the whole world. They, they, you know, they, if you look at pharmaceutical corporations, Western Europe has a few that are also relevant. So, but you know, it's, it's, also, yeah. it's also funded because by the government of Western European countries. So, yeah, sure. And you go again to the point that, you know, I mean, a good. If you look at the U.S., sure, uh, it's called the crowd, uh, it's called the crowding out effect. If you, if the government uh, stops funding something, private oh, no, enterprise no. will stop. Right, let's, let's, let's take some questions, <laughs> Chris. Uh, first, thank you both um, for this. This is awesome. Um, so, you guys brought up the concept of public goods, and you know, there's probably some lines to draw, right? But do you do you believe government should pay for roads? Should you asking me? Yeah. Uh, ultimately, no. I mean, you can't stop paying for roads tomorrow, but ultimately, no. I see no reason why government would have to pay for roads. So how would that happen? Uh, so developers, businesses, that? communities. I mean, there's no shortage of ways in which you can fund public roads, but, uh, roads, particularly today. I mean, 20 years ago, this question would be harder for me to answer, but today it's much easier because you could put up, even if all roads were toll roads, which is not what I believe would happen, you could put a GPS in a car and you could pay exactly based on how many miles and whose roads you travel. So it's easy to solve today. But look, I live in a community where all the roads are private. Why, why are all the roads private? Because the developer wanted me to live in that community. So he made sure there was access. He made sure to build all the roads inside the community. And you know, it's a, it's a small gated community. And you know, we take care of the roads because it's in our interest to take care of the roads. I don't need the federal government to build, to, to take care of my roads, and I don't need an infrastructure bill in order to take care of roads in, in my community. Businesses want roads, but look, it, there's no point in really, I mean, talking about roads. By the time we get to a society where the only thing government is doing is roads, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we can talk about it then. Government does so much today. It's in every aspect of my life, and 50% of my life's work 
in terms of my energy, my effort, my talent goes to the government, right? I pay 50% marginal income, above 50% marginal income tax. There's no justification of that, not for roads. They don't spend any of it for roads, I can guarantee that. Yeah, sure. So let's, again, you know, we, we tendency to respond on the basis of <coughs> theoretical questions. And so why did they build roads in the first place? So how do you get the Eisenhower, you know, interstate system? Why? The are justification you, they did. Are you asked to defend? Yes. So you have it. So it's supposedly it's because you know if the Russians invade us, it's a lie. Yeah. I never thought the Russians would invade. But they you know sort of pushed that idea in order to do that. Who's behind that? Well, the government. There are three reasons. Ford, GM, and Chrysler. And they want to sell the cars. And the government knows and does that. So uh, that's fair enough. That's the way, you know, that's capitalism. He no. likes capitalism. <laughs> no. <laughs> Corporations. No. Yeah. No. no, 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 no. You had your time. Let me say this. Because you know, there is a disingenuous thing here. So he's telling you that he's all for freedom and that capitalism is fantastic and he has no problem with monopoly. Oh, you know, here you have it. That's it. It's in action. That's the history of capitalism. By the way, capitalism is fine with slavery. You know, as much as the founding fathers, you know, with all their individualism, you know, uh, which wasn't, you know, all men are created and equal, by the way. Uh, at least they had the rhetoric of, you know, equality is a good thing. So, for example, I'll ask you, I'm not sure what you would say, uh, but yeah. you know, do you think education should be, primary education should be something people should get? Yeah. Publicly. Think, oh, you're asking me? Yes. You, you, but no, no, you, not publicly. No, no. I, not I think public. they should so, get it, but they should be all fair public. Enough. So that, that's consistent. But do you, you know, so the question is, do you think that public education should be something that it's a right as a citizen, you see? So a right as a citizen, and here we're going to come to some interesting debate, I'm pretty sure. So I think it is. So why would you build a road? So I once, one, once was told I was a neoliberal in Ecuador, which is funny because, you know, as he knows, that's preposterous. I'm a red commie, you know, he thinks. So no, I, have, I, don't, I don't. People have this tendency to view me, you know, as a red commie or as a neoliberal. So they thought I was... He's not a neoliberal. I don't know. You know I'm he's not a, a neoliberal. So he's a libertarian. And you're so not a commie. Thing. I've met commies. So, so the point is, <laughs> I pride more than you think. Uh, so, but the point is, they, they said that I was a neoliberal because I was in favor of a certain. Uh, uh, I was in favor of development banks uh, spending money on infrastructure on roads. And so my point was, do you think you know that? Public education is a good idea if you are, you know, poor indigenous person. Say, I think that an indigenous person in the middle of Amazon in Ecuador should have access to education. Why? And the state should provide it because the markets will not provide it, and he will be handicapped in life. So, if you want to do something about the issues at the bottom, as he said, poverty, you have to give them equality of opportunity. And to do that, you have to give them education. And how in hell are you going to give them education if you give them a road so that they can go to the school and electricity in that school? And so that made me a neoliberal. And that makes me a commie because I'm in favor of giving this guy. But you know, if you're going to be serious about solving the problems at the bottom, you have to deal with the issue of inequality and you have to provide a bunch of public goods. We will have a difference on where you draw the line. My concern is that the line, you know, he wants to draw the line. Good Lord, it's, uh, you know, it's gone. Way over there. And, you know, <laughs> and I think you know, the line is somewhere. You know, and mind you, I think also that not all societies want to have the line in the same place, which is a reasonable thing to do. And that's why when they're democratic, they actually can choose and decide where they put their line and how much you do it. But the question here, and, and I go back always to the question of pregnancy. I don't think pregnancy is a question of, you know, it's, it's a discussion of what, what kind of, you know, how you're going to deal. Are you going to smoke or you're going to, you know, eat only healthy or you're going to, you know, you're going to have a natural, you know, it's, it's a question, but, you know, you are. Once you are, it's not a question that you cannot be half pregnant, you know. And so my, I'm, I'm concerned about those issues. So I, I do think we need uh, public roads, and there is. Uh, I mean, I'm not suggesting that it's all good. So sometimes it's graft and 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 you know and they're you know putting their hands in your pocket. Uh, I'd like to get everybody in. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, if okay. it's brief. Well, I just say that that's our capitalism, right? That that again, I define capitalism as separation of state from economics. If the if the state is now intervening by building these massive roads, and yeah. People lobby, and the way to get rid of cronyism, for example, is to get government out of the economy, because then business doesn't have anything to lobby government for, because they're giving them nothing. And um, thank you, first off, for a very stimulating debate. Um, so I have two questions. The first is 
Would your ideals be the same for both developed and developing countries? Because for the most part, those are apples and oranges. Um, so would you stand by your arguments in that case for both? And then my second question is, um, without a free market society, how would you propose incentives? Um, isn't there some sort of ideal form that the people at the bottom tend to look up to and become inspired by? Um, so. You want me to go first again? Oh, I can go. Why don't you go first? Yeah, sure. Time, please. So, uh, sit down. So if you ask me in general if I think that there is a different way of thinking in economics for developed and developing countries, uh, I don't. I think that surprises many of my colleagues on the left. So I do think that economics applies in the same way. I do think we have different problems. Uh, we face different problems. But the, the, the way the markets uh, sort of work is essentially the same. Um, and I, you know, I would say, if I had to say what's the biggest difference, is uh, in terms of uh, developing countries, so I, I would say two things. So one thing is that uh, most of the technological innovation is done in developed countries, and that has a tendency to be uh, self-path-dependent. Uh, uh, so once you go down one line, you rip benefits. There is a thing in technology that comes from the discussion of philosophy of science that's called technological paradigms. So if you're ahead development, sometimes it's bad, by the way. Sometimes you go down a line, and because you are too invested in this, you end up being locked out of some other technological development that is relevant. So, so coming late to the process of development of capitalism, etc., uh, creates problems for developing countries. The biggest one is that we need always foreign currency, and not having strong currency, not having the dollar, etc., or the pound before, or you know, the Dutch guilder before. Is a problem. So we tend to borrow, borrow in not in domestic currency, which is what we were talking about January, we borrow in foreign currency. So you have cycles of default and whatnot, and essentially say the two collapses of the terms of trade and stuff we sort of, uh, so currency crisis and whatnot. So what I, do I think about free market society and alternatives? I'm, you know, I, one of the things the economists do that I don't do <laughs> is I don't do uh, utopia. I, I find that. And I, you know, that's part of my issue with Yaren. I think that he does utopia in the real world. He thinks that these utopia of free markets solve all the problems and radical individualism. And I, I think that's an utopia. And, and I'm very scared of utopia. By the way, I'm scared when you say we shouldn't treat. Most of the people that go to you know uh, emergency rooms, they don't have full problems. The pe pe you know workers, you know, they avoid going to the emergency room because if they miss a day of work, you know, they miss their they paycheck. They go when they have heavy, serious problems. But yeah, you know, that's my view. But fair enough, because it, it leads to serious consequences for people. So I, I don't know what would be the alternative. But what I tell you is that we don't really have a free market society. We do have a mixed, uh, so, you know, in the Western world, mixed societies. And 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 I'm okay with that. The point is how you know. So what would be this? I I you know I do like the idea of, uh, of uh, Scandinavian you know social democracy. Sure. Is it adaptable and something that you can use in the U.S. or, say, in Brazil? Well, you know, it's problematic. These are countries that are multicultural, gigantic, the histories are different, we have a history of slavery, so I'm, I'm not sure that's immediately feasible. So uh, I, I don't have an utopia that I can tell you that's... Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm in favor of societies democratically discussing how they move towards what they think is a good path for development. Wait, sorry, maybe it wasn't clear. I meant incentives, incentives. not an alternative. Oh, incentives. So, you know, look, it's what I said. What are incentives? So incentives are not just e egoistic incentives. As he said, there are people that go, you know, people do things for all sorts of, uh, of reasons. So, 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 you know, um, there is a, you know, you may, may decide that you love, you know, physics and you want to do this thing and end up doing research in this and maybe you end up wealthy in a society that that's acceptable or not, you know, but, you know, on the other hand, because you got, you know, and several of these people that we're talking, you know, Shockley, whatever, they got public educations, you know, and so if, if you got that, it means you have to give back something to society. How much back? It's fair enough. It's a question that it's open to debate. And it's not going to be, by the way, it's not going to be the same amount in all. So what we used to do back in the 40s and 50s, it's not the same as what we did and, you know, we're doing right now. So, so I'm open for, you know, I think that that, that also is a, a question that it's open for, for uh, the democratic sort of play of ideas. Okay, okay just a... Uh, Sorry, I, I was running over. No, 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 we didn't do, we didn't do, we didn't do. Um, 
I think the, the economic ideals are the same, but there's a, there's, a, there's a structural issue that has to happen before economics. And a lot of times when countries go for a very authoritarian towards freedom, they forget the structural point, um, which is different because developed countries usually have it already. And that is property rights and the rule of law. You, you cannot have markets until you have property rights and the rule of law. And, uh, and most of, the, of undeveloped countries forget that step. Russia, for example, when it went for communism, forgot the step of the rule of law. So what they got was, the, was in a sense, the mafia controlling, oligarchs controlling all the industries because they had bigger guns than anybody else. Uh, and and then, they, then they bribed the government to protect them and they elected Putin and now he's, you know, he's their boss. So uh, it's, a, it's a corrupt scheme of things. So you have to first establish property rights and you have to establish the rule of law in order to, in order to then put together your economic policy. And I would say once you do that, uh, the economy should be free. I'm, I'm a big fan when it comes to Latin America, my guess is you're not, but I don't know, of Hernando de Soto, a Peruvian economist, who says that one of the ways in which you would, you would restructure Latin American economies is by, is by uh, giving property rights to the peasants. Right, give them capital in a sense. They, they, they own the land anyway, they've been on this land forever, they, they cultivate, give them property rights, and then they can use that as capital to do other things, and that's how you, how you change the dynamics in Latin America. And I'm a big, big supporter of that, big believer in that. Um, but that's, that's a, a pre-stage, and then you establish markets. Markets, when there's no laws, markets, <coughs> or when there's no rule of law, uh, then what you have is the rule of the gun. Then what you have is the, is the gang with the biggest gun gets all the goodies, and that's what happened in Russia, for example, in the 1990s. Uh, it, it wasn't capitalism, it was, it was, anarchy. It was closer to anarchy. Uh, and I'm not an anarchist, by the way, as you've noticed, I emphasize the role of government. Um, in terms of, well, incentives, I, 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 you know, I think we somewhat agree here, in the sense, don't overestimate incentives, right? Not everybody's incentivized by money, or not to the same degree. Some of us are incentivized by, by other passions. If you're an artist, I told my kids, pursue your passion, right? Now, I'm living to regret that because both of them pursued uh, the entertainment business and, and they're probably, <laughs> it's hard for them to make money, right? But they're pursuing their passions and they're not pursuing money, right? So I, I think you have to watch, it, it, the reason they have capitalism is not because it provides incentives. The reason to have capitalism, in my view, is because it leaves us free to live as we see fit, including the choice not to pursue money, or, or to pursue, not to pursue money as a primary, or not to pursue a lot of money as a primary. You, you need some money to live, so you know, don't, don't become paupers. Uh, I will, um, I do want to say this quickly, it's not part of the question, although it's somewhat related. If you're interested in the economics of free markets, then I would read uh, Ludwig von Mises. Now, it's true, the Austrian economists don't prove this stuff mathematically, but that's because we believe that economics is not primarily a mathematical science, that its human behavior cannot be modeled mathematically. So von Mises doesn't do math, but I still think he proves his case. Now, you know, everybody else, everything else you teach in economics is the opposite of what I just said, so this is just a little bit of counterbalance. I don't know. I mean, von Mises, if I may say something about that, von Mises is a neoclassical economist. Everything no. you learn, he is. He's an Austrian economist. So he, he says exactly the same thing. So the, if you go and read Mises and Hayek, they basically say, you know, look at their theories, for example, of the rate of interest. It's savings and investment. It's, you know, basically the supply and demand in the capital market. And you get it's a loanable funds theory. It's yeah. essentially the same as you have in Vixel. You have in any neoclassical economist going, I mean, that goes to your thought. So I have read them. And here's it. The problem with von Mises is not that he doesn't do mathematics. It's the problem with von Mises is that he doesn't do logic. And logic <laughs> and evidence have matter, man. And, you know, uh, they, there is no proof of this stuff. You know, the notion is generically that markets do wonderful things and you hear angels and they get the prices right. You see? But markets don't necessarily do that. I'm not saying that, you know, I think that there is a, a confusion in another you know, thing that you, you discuss capitalism as uh, an environment in which you can get your, the right to do what you want. That's democracy. And so political, so capitalism is, is not a, a political system, although, and there have been very different political systems under you know, uh, capitalism. Democracy uh, is sort of what you want when you want to be able to do what you want, and we'll have a difference of that. And I would suggest to you that capitalism, with some of its tendencies, tendencies to generate excessive inequality, uh, to generate uh, excessive power in the hands of people. So 
Perhaps you think that uh, money is voice, and people should have the right to use, you know, money in the public arena to buy, you know, politicians, which I think leads to, you know, corruption and cronyism and whatnot. So I'm saying, since you're paying lip service to the idea of freedom, uh, if, you, if you believe in that, uh, in Citizens United. Uh, so in that case, capitalism is part of the problem that won't allow certain people to reach their potential. And you know, and to have democracy. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying that capitalism <coughs> is the only thing in capitalism that it's really important. Capitalism is the first system of production that it's really dynamic. Capitalism, because of its inherent need of, you know, competition and out uh, outpace the others, leads to innovation. That's one of the incentives, if you want, uh, you know, to your question. Uh, and, and I think that that's uh, certainly something that has had a positive effect. So not everything that comes from capitalism. But yeah, it has a downside, you see? It generates too much concentration and may lead to people not being able. So we, his kids are free to, and my kid too, though he's not, he's still in high school, but you know, yeah. a pursuit of mine, you know, to pursue whatever they want. But the counterpart of this is that somewhere there is a girl in Bangladesh that is suing, you know, stuff at, you know, uh, essentially with slave labor, you know, uh, wages. And so that's a counterpart of capitalism. So it's a dangerous system. Uh, I'm not suggesting that uh, I have, that's my point. I don't have an idea that we put this out and we'll solve all the things. I'm very scared about notions of this kind of thing in general. Let's see, we have time for one more. Uh, oh, in the back. Yes, thank you. Uh, I hope this isn't a practical snare, but I thought this topic of healthcare regulation and sniffles was interesting. And you brought it up recently. Uh, the expectation that diseases will be treated. This is my, my question for Dr. Brokers, obviously, uh, that diseases will be treated um, not for emergency rooms or even doctor's office as a cost for healthcare. Uh, for example, as making hospitals less safe because of the sniffles, because of bacteria and viruses that the regulations might um, lead people by way of an expectation that healthcare will pay and treat anything, that this is some, this might be a hidden cost. Is that what you were saying? Is that, is that a reasonable one? Um... I'll just say quickly, I mean, just to clarify. All I said was because emergency rooms are free, right? they have to treat you no matter what you, if you go in the evening to an emergency room, you're right, they don't take a day off of work, they all go in the evening. And I've been to an emergency room with real issues in the evening. And what you get is long, long lines of people because they're not feeling well. Not because they have a, a life-threatening disease, but because they're not feeling well. They use it as their primary care physician. And that cost has to be borne by somebody, so it's borne by those people who pay insurance. And that's the, that's the fee wider problem that you get in the healthcare markets as they were before Obamacare. And it's still law because, because so many people are still uninsured. But, uh, but I, that's just the point of clarification. I don't think it's essential. Do uh, you want to take another question? Should you do that? Well, oh, no. Yeah, I mean, we can have a discussion if, about if you're, No, very briefly. So if, if you're concerned with that kind of stuff, you, know, you go to Western Europe. You know, US has a very peculiar system because we provide, we provide health insurance only for the elderly. And that comes from Social Security. That's the you, only Medicare. country in the world. It's, it's Medicare. Medicare, yes. So it's for the elderly. So, so that doesn't happen. If you go to Europe, you receive health in most Western European countries on the basis of being a citizen, like the story I said about public... Uh, so once you have that, and, and there is a mandate of the state of doing that, the costs are lower too. You know? And they do treat everybody in hospitals. And it's cheaper. And they do have better health outcomes. So should we and they're more equalitarian societies. Oh, I'm for uh, so should, public health. So should we debate this, since we brought it up? Uh, so we might as well end with this. Yeah, I, I disagree totally. Uh, I come from a socialized medicine country. My father was a doctor in a socialized medicine country. A, a country that has more doctors per capita than any country in the world, because it's a Jewish country. Um, and uh, if you're really sick, if you're really sick, my father would advise you to get on a plane and get to the Mayo Clinic if you can afford it, um, in spite of all of that. If you look at survivability rates, if you look at catastrophic stuff, if you look at the number of people who in the NHS in England die <coughs> waiting for an MRI, die waiting for me to be diagnosed, yes, we pay more for healthcare in the United States. Cool. I paid more for healthcare because I got treated and I got, I, you know, I got examined and I was told, I, I once had this weird thing going on, and I was told nothing, there's no problem, you're okay. That was worth the money to be known that. If I'd been in Israel, I would have waited three weeks and if I had something, I would be dead. So, um, 
and as I said, the fact that we still have private healthcare in the United States subsidizes the healthcare for the rest of the world. So, no, healthcare outcomes here are much better. Um, if you look, if you look at the numbers, so let me let, let's let's look at the numbers, right? If you're a Swede in the United States, you live as long as a Swede in Sweden, or maybe longer. It, it, look at that. Look at the data. If you're a Japanese in the United States, Japanese live longer than any people on the planet. Uh, if you're Japanese in America, you live as long or longer than a Japanese in Japan. Uh, when you control for the fact that we are so diverse and that there are enormous genetic factors that determine longevity, then the differences in life expectancy disappear uh, in the United States. Uh, and, and, and that's true of a lot of things when you compare Scandinavia to America. If you look at Scandinavians in America versus Scandinavians in Scandinavia, they're just as happy if not happier. They're wealthier than the Scandinavian brothers. Come on, man, that argument, yeah. It's so true. Of yeah, sure, it's of course true. it's true. Yeah. If you get Scandinavians that arrive in the 19th century that are white and blonde and you know, are part they of the wealthy well. part, yeah, sure, they've yeah. done very well, yeah. and they even have the best health care kids, it doesn't matter if it's private or not, and then you're putting together African Americans that we imposed 400 years of slavery, mm -hmm. and according to you, you know, it's all oh, tough luck. And you know, and I say that, and no, 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 you know, and then you have, they have obviously they push down, you know, uh, some of the health outcomes, and you're telling me, oh, yeah, screw them. No, so I'm not saying screw them. I'm yeah, saying and you can't blame private and, and medicine, medicine for them. No, but let me say this because I think you we should end on this note. This is an important point because you said, who cares? Who cares about inequality? It's all about you know these three problems: poverty at the bottom, cronyism on top, and growth. And again, you pay lip service to the solving the problems at the bottom because your solution means those black guys that have, you know, say, higher rates of, of, of uh, uh, diabetes. Sure. Screw them. They should, you know, it's their problem. It's their responsibility. Even though part of the reason why they're there is because they are poor, because we oppress them over years, because you know uh, we have we have uh, issues associated to uh, obesity and all of those things that come with low income. You, you know, so the notion if, if you're not going to pay lip service to that, yes, yeah, you know, the way to think about and the other thing you think of medicine as being just curative. You don't think of the role, the preventive medicine. So a good part of our problems, we let the problems accumulate. Whereas a good chunk of what happens in Western Europe is that we have preventive you know, medicine. And so most of the problems are caught early on. And so you don't need the expensive care. So he wouldn't be dead you know, because you wouldn't need the three you know, thing weeks in advance, hopefully. Because you would have you know, some other thing going on that would help you know, and, and, and wouldn't lead to this sort of stuff. So uh, you know, the, the notion that uh, it, you know, we have better outcomes is it's very hard to defend. It, it's post-factual, I would say. No, it's, 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 empirically, it's empirically true. And I'll say I don't give lip service to the poor. Uh, I care about poor kids. I care about poor kids that are priced out of the labor market by minimum wages. I care about poor kids that are priced out of jobs because of licensing laws. I care about poor kids that don't have a job because we've limited growth and jobs are not being created in this country. The way to solve the problem of poverty is by more freedom and more jobs, not by more regulations and more controls and more redistribution. All right, we'll stop, we'll stop it there. <laughs> Let's thank our two debaters.